They are called minor simply because they are shorter than the five major prophets. So the other major prophets, their books fit, fit on one scroll of papyrus, whereas all 12 minor prophets fit on one scroll. So they're minor simply because they are shorter, not because their message is any less relevant or impactful. Today we're going to study the minor prophet Joel, and Joel is one of the later prophets, chronologically, uh, from the best scholars can tell, he wrote somewhere between the 2nd and 3rd centuries BCE. This is long after the Israelites returned from exile, it, they've already established the temple back in Jerusalem, uh, they have returned from their exile, they have built up a new kingdom. And yet, as so often happens to the Israelites, difficult times have come. Things have happened. Their land is desolate and destitute. So Joel comes as a prophet, first to bring a word of judgment, but then to ultimately bring a word of hope that things will get better, that troubled times won't last forever. As we listen to today's scripture lesson, I hope that you hear from it what I call the grand sweep. The key ideas, the key learnings that are found about our faith and about how God works in our world and works in our lives from Genesis to Revelation. And thus, when we hear those, We'll also hear about the landscape of our faith, how God is continually working in our lives, in every moment, in every day, no matter what. So today I ask you to pray for me as I share this message, as I pray for each of you in receiving it. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and right and joyful and acceptable in your sight, for you truly are, each and every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you know that I'm a big country music fan, and one of my favorite groups is Rascal Flatts. Any of you like Rascal Flatts? Oh yeah, I see a lot of hands go up. There was this one song that I like, and it's a little less familiar than some of their more popular songs, but it's called Backwards. Have any of you ever heard their song called Backwards? Good, I might get to teach you something today. As I reference the scripture lesson this morning, we are going to have to go backwards in order to understand what has happened to the Israelites and thus what is going to happen to them in future times. We're going to have to backtrack. And so that brought to mind uh, this week as I was preparing this sermon uh, of this song called Backwards. And here's the chorus. There are two guys. They're talking. And one says to the other, do you want to know what happens when you get to play a country song backwards? And the other guy is curious, obviously, and he says, no, I don't know. What happens when you get to play a country song backwards? And here's the chorus. When you get to play a country song backwards, you get your house back, you get your dog back, you get your best friend Jack back, you 
get your truck back, you get your boat back, you get your first and second wives back. (laughs) You get it all back when you play a country song backwards. Well, today we look at the prophet Joel. And before we read the passage, it's important that we backtrack and talk a little bit about what has happened just prior to Joel speaking to his fellow Israelites. Remember, the Israelites have come back from exile. They've been in their homeland for many years now. They've rebuilt the temple. But yet they have fallen on hard times. In fact, some very serious natural disasters happened to them. There's a fire that has decimated the land. There's a drought that has decimated the land. And then there are swarms and swarms of locusts that have decimated the land, decimated their lives. They are desolate. All of their granaries that were once filled with wonderful grain that they shipped and sold and traded, they're empty. All the vats that were filled with wine and oil that were shipped and sold and traded are empty. And they're at a loss. Their lives are decimated. They are desolate. And they see this as somehow they have a failed to be obedient to God, that somehow they have sinned and done something wrong against God, and that is why all of a sudden everything they had that was good was taken away from them. But then Joel comes, and Joel comes to speak a word of first judgment, but then he really comes to speak a word of hope. He comes to speak a word of renewal, and commitment to let them know that God has not left them, that God is still working in their lives. God is in their midst. Joel comes to give a message of recommitment and promise to them. On Ash Wednesday, in every Ash Wednesday service, uh, there's a line from Joel that you'll hear, and it's this. Even now, Think about that. Even now, if you will return to me, the Lord, gracious and merciful, the Lord will provide. So now, when we read this passage this morning, it looks like all the things that were taken away from the Israelites are all the things that they lost just like that country song says, are about to come back to them. So with that in mind, I ask you to turn with me to today's scripture. It's from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. I ask you if you would like to follow along in your bulletins or in your personal Bibles. Hear these words. O children of Zion, Be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophecy. 
Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God for the people of God, and God's people say, So as we listen to that passage this morning, one of the things that strikes me in this little book, Joel is only three chapters long, I invite you to go home this afternoon and read it, it won't take you very long at all. In this little book, we see an overview of some of the most important ideas and realities that are expressed in scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. It shows how God works in the world, how God is present in our lives, how God restores, how God gives, how God is always present. These ideas are central to our faith. And because Joel offers them up so beautifully in just a little space, I want this morning to review them with you all so that you can take away three important points that are essential to your faith, to our faith, and to how God is working in this world and working in your lives. First, it's clear that the Israelites have once again experienced hardship. It seems just when they start to get ahead, something happens, and they are pushed back down again. And isn't that true for our lives, too? From time to time, we all experience hardship. From time to time, just when we think we are getting ahead and we may have some things figured out, something completely unexpected happens and pushes us back a few steps again. (laughs) Life is not easy, Street, and pain and struggle are real. But Joel, in this passage and in his book, reminds us that troubles do not last forever. There's a psalm that captures this beautifully, and you may be able to finish it for me. It says, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You see, troubles do not last forever. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, pain and struggle are real. Troubles do not last forever. Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, is so confident of this, he says that we should rejoice even in the times of our suffering. Troubles do not last forever. So this morning, if you're a person who is experiencing trouble of some sort, of any sort, know that the pain and struggle you are feeling, they're real and they're valid, but know with God's help, God will help you move through it, that God is good and wants to give abundant life. When we place our faith and trust in God, when we rely on Jesus Christ to be our Savior, when we put our whole being into the power of the Holy Spirit, God will help us through anything. Joel assures us that troubles 
do not last forever. And the second thing Joel assures us of is that obedience brings blessing. Hear that again. Obedience brings blessing. Joel calls his people, the Israelites, to return with their whole hearts to God. If they return with their whole hearts and minds and soul to God, God will surely take care of them. And that call continues to come in our lives today. When we put our whole faith, our whole body, our whole minds, our whole lives in the hands of God, when we are obedient to God's will and God's calling in our life, no matter how difficult it may be, it will bring blessing. Now, this doesn't mean it will bring material blessing. In fact, material acquisitions are probably, as we look through Scripture, uh, some of the least likely blessings you'll find. However, we see Joel showing his people that they will return to their land and it will be filled with plenty and they will receive their blessing together in community. Community is so important, friends. Blessing just isn't about our individual lives, but it's about living together in sync as a community, as a family, being together moving forward. Obedience brings blessing. And blessing is most often found, most powerfully found, through community. I think about the times in my life where I have made an honest attempt to be obedient. And that hasn't always happened. There are many times in days and months and years in my life where I have not made an honest attempt to be obedient. Perhaps some of you feel the same. But I know when I consciously make an honest attempt to be obedient, God provides blessing in my life. And again, it doesn't always mean materially, but it means how God enriches my lives with relationships with people with family, with friends, with community. God cares for our needs, and God loves us unconditionally. If we attempt to be obedient to God, really be obedient, following no matter how difficult it is what God has called us to do, we will find blessing in our lives. And that means our lives will be enriched beyond anything we can ever imagine. Relationships, community, grace, love, forgiveness, redemption, transformation. Obedience brings blessing. Then the next one, the next theme that I think uh, Joel beautifully outlines in his prophecy this morning, I think it's the hardest one for us because it makes us admit to ourselves that we may not have everything figured out and that we may be wrong about some things and we may be doing some things that we know we shouldn't be doing. It actually is a prerequisite for that step about living in true obedience. And it's this. Repentance is necessary. Repentance is necessary. And that's hard for us to hear. Many of us have some baggage associated with that word for something a preacher or a teacher once said. But again, as we look through the scope of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, we will see that God is calling us to repentance. Again, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. 
And when you come forward this Wednesday to receive the imposition of ashes, what the pastor will say as he or she places that cross of ash on your forehead is this. Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is necessary. God provides for us. God is present with us. But God doesn't leave us where we are to dwell in the muck and the mire of our lives. Instead, God calls us into a new reality, a new beginning, and that always begins with our repentance. Repentance is about change, real and lasting change. It's about turning in a new direction, a direction of obedience. There's obedience popping up again. Repentance is an acknowledgement of the places where we have failed in our lives. And I have failed in many. It's about the places where we have let God down. Repentance is even about the places in which we know we have broken God's heart. In the act of repentance, in repenting, we say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be obedient to you with all of my heart, with all of my mind. Repentance is saying to the Lord, I want to seek after you. I want to seek after your will for my life. You see, when we repent, we renew our own commitment and sense of that abundant love that God so freely gives us. And repentance is not just a one-time thing. I find I have to do it daily. Repentance is necessary. And in looking at those three themes, we also see an important theme about God emerge. Joel teaches us something essential about God's nature, the key characteristics of God. God is faithful, always working for our good. God's generosity provides abundance. Think about the scripture and how generous God is. Once again, the granaries are filled. Once again, the vats are overflowing with wine and oil. The locusts have gone. The fires have stopped. The plagues have done. God is an abundant God, a generous God. And God desires to give us abundance. God desires to be generous toward us. God desperately wants his people to live in abundance. And that's all of his people. Everyone, everywhere. God is no respecter of persons. And that means God loves all of God's children. It doesn't matter where you're born, what gender you are, how much money you have in the bank, you name it. God loves all of God's children. God is an abundant God, and God wants us to, to live our lives abundantly as well. So what does that mean for us? As modern day Christians, living in the 21st century, where the world right now seems a little off kilter, we're not quite sure what's going to happen next, where you know, there's a little bit of chaos and a lot of brokenness. What it means is that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, 
have the responsibility to live our lives with abundance and then share that abundance with others. To be ambassadors of Christ. Agents of light. To shine light in a broken and dark world. To fill up the cracks of this world with God's love. To show to all people everywhere that our God is a loving God, a generous God, a faithful God, and an abundant God. And if you put your faith and trust in God through the person of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, your life can and will be transformed. So as we go out into the world today, let us remember the lessons we have learned from Joel. Let us remember that troubles never last, that obedience brings blessing, and that repentance is necessary. And then let us remember the key characteristics of God. That God is always faithful, God is always loving, and that God provides abundance. And then let us go out into the world and live our lives in that spirit. A spirit of faithfulness, a spirit of generosity, a spirit of abundance. And let us share the good news of Jesus Christ to this entire world one person at a time. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you so much thanks that you are indeed a gracious and a loving God. We thank you for the message that we find in Joel, that even though it was written somewhere between the 2nd and 3rd centuries BCE, that its message is still so relevant to us today. That's the timelessness and the truth of Scripture. Be with us as we go out into the world to live our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, to live our lives with faith and generosity and grace and abundance. May we use our lives to affect real and lasting change in this world so the whole world may come to know the truth found through faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we make disciples for Jesus Christ for all the nations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.